Hey, <clears throat> how's it going, everyone? It's John Reed. Yep, uh, I'm on a little bit of a solo flight today. This could be the shortest live video in history. It could actually, this could be the shortest live video in the history of John Reed Enterprises. This could be an absolute friggin' disaster. Um, this is an ask, ask me anything type of format. So it's really dependent on y'all in the chat. If you show up and ask me a few questions, then we'll talk for a while. We're going to focus on AI skills development and just in general, the impact of automation on skills and some of my thinking over the years on not only just how to stay ahead of the machines, but how to find enterprise career success. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how to find enterprise career success, but I want to answer your questions. And if you get really vocal with me, I might even ask you to join me on camera here. So just be forewarned, it could happen. Uh, <clears throat> this could be one of the uh, shortest videos that I ever do uh, because I don't have a guest this week. I'm usually going to have a guest, but it's election week and I wanted to give everyone a break. People are tired, but I'm crazy enough to go online. So I'm going to do it. So let's see your comments and questions and that will give me something to work with. Otherwise, uh, you're going to listen to a little bit of a monologue and that's really friggin' boring. <clears throat> Before I get into it, uh, when I do have guests, it's basically kind of a reboot of my longtime podcast series, but with a live video component. And it's really structured more in a radio format. Um, and Sean, thank you for that question. I'm going to get to it in just a minute. Uh, so I call it Enterprise Hits and Misses Radio because I have a weekly column called Hit, Hits and Misses on Diginomica, which is kind of a snarky review of the week's activities. And the whole goal of the, the reason I call it a radio show is it's kind of a wannabe DJ thing of just talk radio into the night, right? Take people's questions and comments. None of this talking head crap, no sponsors, no BS, just real enterprise conversations. So anyhow, we're going to start with, uh, with, with Sean's question here. <laughs> what are the, some of the most impactful AI use cases you've come across? Uh, well, Sean, you raise a really interesting question. To be honest with you, I haven't seen too many that that really that really blow me away. I mean, in any time you bring one up, you can come up with a counter argument for why it sucks. I mean, I think it depends a little bit on how we define AI. Okay, so on the one hand, there's a bunch of workflow automation capabilities that sometimes get under the AI umbrella. I think workflow automation can be powerful, and what I'm seeing increasingly is empowering users to create self-service automation workflows uh, with the right platform and the right approach. I'm not going to pimp any particular vendors here, uh, but I've seen this uh, in action. And when when you see it's you can call it low code or no code or wherever the hell you want, doesn't matter. The point is, I can create business workflows without the help of IT. Is that AI? Some would maybe label some of that as AI, but I really look for what you might call like some level of cognitive intelligence, some aspect of learning behavior. That's my sort of threshold for AI. So I want, I want the machine not to be operating just based on rules, but based on actual learning from interactions. And that's where it gets a little bit tricky. So for example, if I use like a lot of companies are using various forms of chat bots which claim to learn from prior interactions. Um, if they simply reduce like customer service workload, is that a good result? Maybe on the surface, but then you have to look at how many, what percentage of people were disaffected uh, users based on those interactions. Um, so the most promising things right now, Sean, to get back to your question, I think are the kinds of so-called augmented intelligence capabilities that you might have. Um, a couple of years ago at a, a Tableau show, one of the coolest things I saw was uh, was a vendor. <clears throat> I'm not going to name them because I don't want to get into too much like vendor pushing right now, but I saw a vendor that was basically integrating text-based um, prescriptive suggestions into any chart that you might see. So as soon as the chart came up, there were text-based prescriptions. This is what you're looking at. This is why it might matter. And one of the things I loved about that is that you know, dashboards can be a little bit static, right? And just because you have a dashboard doesn't mean you're going to make a better decision. 
so I really like that example of just immediately fleshing it out with text-based guidance and narrative and then role-based prescriptive information. I was super impressed with, with some of the live stuff I saw on that. Um, but you know, you, you can find these in a lot of industries. I mean, so another interesting one, Sean is, you know, obviously, uh, the sort of the risk stuff that we see in the financial services industry, right? Where you get all kinds of pings, Hey, did you log on to your account or blah, 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 fraud protection? I don't know. I mean, to me, that's not terribly impressive. I think it's, you know, like, like Google, for example, supposedly an AI leader, they can't even figure out like when I'm logging on laptop in my own like uh, apartment, they can't figure out like that that's still me. They have to like verify, is this you? It's the same friggin' IP address that I'm using before. So to me, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So as far as it's okay, but it's that feels more like automation than AI. It doesn't feel like it's learning anything. So I get a little concerned when I see like that the Amazons and, and Googles of the world don't seem to be getting better with some of these basic things. Um, having said that, I, I do think that some of these things are on the horizon. And obviously, Sean, in the recommendation space, we see a lot of that, right? So the power of AI for e-commerce recommendations has basically been proven, whether it's Netflix or, or Amazon. Hi, Sandy. It was nice to see you earlier. I'm back on video. <laughs> Probably not for too long, but uh, I'm, I'm basically just fielding questions on AI career development, impact of automation, and career success. Um, one thing I will mention to the listeners is, you know, and this is probably obvious by now, but, you know, everyone needs to take a proactive approach to career and skill development. And there's really no employer that you can put your faith in as far as where they're going to take you um, in the long term. You you have to have your proactive plan for where you're trying to go. And so, well, how do you do that? And my baseline recommendation is to do an annual skills gap analysis. Look at, do an honest sort of uh, accounting of where you're strong and where you're not. And, and and contrast that against how you want to evolve in your career and figure out where the gaps are. You have to have a couple things in mind. You have to have your sort of overall career trajectory in mind. And then you also have to have, uh, you know, your sense of industry in mind, where you thrive, where you, where you have some some passion. Um, you know, it's really bit, really different if you know you want to remain a hands-on person versus whether you want to be more of an executive or team lead at some point. Um, so there's different career trajectories for different people. And then you have to understand how trends are evolving, which is why I centered in a little bit on AI here today, because obviously regardless of the hype automation of various flavors is having a huge impact. Uh, LinkedIn user. I think I know who you are from last week. Sounds like natural language programming stuff. Like when we added commentary to data, data, data sets automatically works really well. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, the so so there's there's a number of sort of phases of AI to think about, right? Way way in the future is the so-called general AI. You know, the the you know, it's the terminator-esque self-aware machine. Um I don't think there's there's any trajectory on whether that's even possible as much as the hype is there, right? But if you want to put timeframes on it, you're talking 30, 50 years out at least. But but then there's sort of some sequential steps you can look at now. One is the automation I was describing. The second is moving into automation where there is a learning component, where the machine's obviously learning from your responses. Uh, the third piece is, is when that machine starts to really augment the augmented intelligence piece of helping you to do your job better, which is what I described from the Tableau type scenario of automating prescriptive recommendations and things like that. Um, you potentially, I've seen some examples of automating certain pricing decisions, but again, a lot of times there's some rule-based stuff in there. So maybe it's cheating a little bit, um, but a lot of pricing decisions, for example, in the consumer goods area need to be, be made very quickly. And so if you set certain parameters, Perhaps you can entrust machines to 
to make certain decisions around that. Um, but then um, the next step, which is a big step beyond where we are in a lot of enterprise professions, is is sort of that complete AI takeover of a of an end to end job, right? So the classic example would be the self-driving car. And, uh, you know, eventually, right, we're going to have self-driving cars. It seems pretty likely. We can talk about timeframes. I happen to think it's a little further out than many. But uh, I don't think we're going to have truck drivers in 20 years, for example. So within the parameters of that self-defined job, for the, for the vast majority of truck drivers, you're not going to be trucking anymore. Um, so what we're looking at is, you know, how how do how do I anticipate that type of future in my profession in my industry, and get ahead of it? You know, uh, obviously, as as an analyst and journalist, I deal with this all the time because, you know, there was this whole uh, new uh, open text engine that's come out that's supposedly going to take my job. So I have to take a look at that writing and see can, can this computer like take actually take my job or not. And so I get to make that assessment and figure out how I can compete against that. Um, we have a uh, Thomas in the chat. Uh, there are a number of free online learning resources on AI. AI. Yep, absolutely. Um, elements of AI. Do you think those are worthwhile for an up and starter or someone who is looking for a technical career change? Thank you for asking that, Thomas. And I did fall behind a little bit on the um, popping up the questions. Let me let me pop up a couple that I addressed already. Um, sorry about that, but I'm solo flight, so I'm still getting used to. Uh, Managing everything. <clears throat> um, yeah, so obviously when I first started this, I was talking about this element of self-directed learning. Um, you know, that I think there always has to be some form of self-directed learning in, in your career path, whatever career path it is. Exactly how you do that, you have to figure out. And there are different paths to skills development, some of, some of which you can accomplish on your own some of which requires some self-directed learning online. And then I think some stuff may require an immersive component where you actually attend, if not in person, like more of a real live classroom setting. And it's up to you to kind of figure out what, what your uh, pace of learning is and whether you can have the budget and time to, to devote to these formats. But it's really key to understand what the difference is. So I'll give you one example in my life for a lot of things I can research on my own. Like I do a lot of inter enterprise research and curation uh, on my own time. Um, but when I'm looking, for example, to hone my writing chops, I attend writing conferences. Um, I've been doing some live ones this year, which are immersive, right? Because I need interaction to better understand where my profession is headed and how I can get better. And I figure that out about myself, so I'm willing to pay some money to do that. I can't do that on my own completely. Um, so you have to kind of figure out for yourself, but there are a ton of free resources around AI to, uh, to address Thomas's point. I think the key there is what, how your skill set connects to that. I mean, obviously, if you're, if, you're, if you're a developer, there's an obvious sort of path and motivation um, towards starting to better understand um, you know, the construction of algorithms and statist statistical math and things like that. When you're a business user, I think it's a different set of questions. Um, but one of the really core questions that I think we all have to look at in our so-called gap analysis of our careers is uh, how do I help my business better understand data and how, how do I better use analytics to inform what I do? And also what are the pitfalls um, am I getting caught up in KPI culture to the point that I'm measuring myself against the wrong things? Um, there's a lot of considerations, but you have to understand your angle before you, you, you take, take a ton of AI classes. But for myself, I've watched a lot of AI stuff on YouTube, for example, and there's some really good stuff, both, um, you know, things like Ted talks to give you more of the big overview. And then, uh, you know, more specific things like, uh, MIT, for example, has a bunch of, uh, curriculum based stuff on there. It's uh, pretty, pretty in-depth and it costs nothing. Um, let's see what Thomas has to say here. Oh, uh, that was the, f that was the last one. Okay. Uh, LinkedIn user. When the pricing modeling automation works out from consumer analysis, uh, <coughs> the consumer analysis forecast notices is and sends message back saying, are you sure? Yeah. Right. I mean, that can work both ways, right? Like, 
one thing we figured out about machines is they're really good at anomaly detection. So if, if a user misconfigures a system, one of the best uses of machine automation right now is to flag those exceptions. So if, if I manually misprice something, the, the machine can call me on it. Um, the, the elegant art of AI design is to figure out how to make it so that when the machine steps to a certain parameter, it escalates to a, to, to a human. And there's, there's very few processes of import to a business that the people want to fully automate right now. So there is an element where there has to be a human element in the design. And so obviously if you're a good AI designer, we desperately need you right now to figure out how to design a halfway decent chatbot that actually knows when to escalate properly and when not to. I just had a crappy experience with an Amazon chatbot the other day, um, seeking a refund for a product. And you know, the, the skepticism around a lot of this stuff is if, if Amazon can't, can't figure this out, then, then who can't? So that, that kind of shows you the, the amount of work we, we still have to do. One of the other key components as you're thinking about your enterprise career planning is thinking about this tech biz crossover issue. So how technical your skills should be versus how functional or business oriented your skills should be. And that's a really interesting issue. Um, I, I tend to think that these days you need to push yourself a little bit towards the middle. Um, so the extremes don't tend to work as well anymore. So, you know, that sort of like geeked out techie techie. I remember when I did my book resume from hell, I made fun of some people who there was a programmer who was like, you know, I had this beautiful design, but the business crushed it. Right. Because like you, you're, you're working on, on the, on the business specs and the more you understand them, then your beautiful designs won't, won't get crushed. <laughs> For the, for the business user, not understanding the underlying platform and technology can be a huge, huge handicap. So between the two uh, is, is some type of middle ground. Um, and, you know, without like too much of an aggressive plug of, of Diginomica, um, that, that's kind of what we're trying to accomplish in a lot of our editorial content is to try to help these so-called two sides talk to each other. But I think you could look at that from a personal uh, career path level as well. Um, all right, a couple more to show here. Uh, let's see, Thomas again. Talking about your Amazon experience, isn't the design of a chatbot rather a UX skill than an AI skill? How important will UX skills be in the next years? What kinds of UI are more interesting than others? <laughs> yeah, true. I mean, that's that's the thing, Thomas, about these AI things is people call them AI chatbots, but how... Um, intelligent are they? I kind of covered a little bit of that in the beginning. Um, I, I would argue that if it's not learning from the interactions, then it's not AI per se. Um, there's probably some crossover between the two and that you want to understand how, what, what algorithms are, are, are powering these, these chat interactions. But a lot of it, a chatbot is basically consuming documentation on the back end. So a lot of it is, is really more just modeling data and creating the proper data repository to answer user questions. Um, but, you know, how much of that is rules-based versus not would be one of the key criteria. UX design is really important, obviously, and we're looking at the extent to which conversational interactions are going to be preferred. Uh, I think in many cases they will be, and uh, in other cases they, they simply will not be preferred. And so one of the difficulties right now, Thomas, and you know this as well as anyone, because this is your area of expertise, I think, uh, is uh, the omni-channel issue, right? And uh, consumers want to choose their channel, and a lot of some of that is generational and age-based. And uh, you know, I, I I'm really a tough one because sometimes I want the phone, sometimes I want to uh, resolve it via via chat. It really depends, but uh, but I've been perpetually disappointed by my experiences, and a lot of it has to do with things like. Uh, the, the underlying data silos uh, don't connect. Uh, the chatbots aren't very good. And let's face it, the humans aren't very good. In, in an ideal world, the chatbots are taking care of the mundane interactions and, and the humans are taking care of the more sophisticated interactions. So what is the impact of that from a skills perspective? Well, it it means that your, your premier customer service reps need to be uh, you know, very savvy about 
working with your VIP customers on, on more escalated problem resolution, because hopefully the automation is taking care of all the BS password resets and stuff like that. But the problem is a lot of times the automation layer isn't, isn't there yet. So to your point around the skills, it really depends. I mean, sometimes the best UX is, is no UX at all, right? Like sometimes things should just happen automatically. Um, so it, it's, it's really this intense desire to understand your, your customer. And I suppose that's sort of the, one of the core fundamentals of a skills gap analysis right now is understanding your, your business's customers and, and, and what your role is, even if you have no external customer interactions right now, like what those customers really need and delivering on that. And that's really a big change. I mean, when I, when I was a headhunter in the nineties and, uh, friend Lou, he, he remembers those days, uh, because he's, he was connected to me back then. Hi Lou, long time, brother. Uh, back, back in those days, uh, you know, a, a customer focused mentality wasn't really required. I mean, I remember, um, and, um, I, I owe a lot to Lou's family cause they, they got me into this field. Uh, but anyhow, in, in that period of time, I was uh, working with ERP when it was exploding and very sexy. I know it's hard to imagine ERP being sexy now, but it was back then. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I, I eventually compiled some of the most ridiculous examples into this book, Resume Some Hell. But, you know, one of the things in the book was this guy sending me an update. He was like a $200 an hour guy at the time. And he, he's a developer. And he's like, as always, I walk on water and bill at, obs- at obscene rates. And that was really the vibe at the time. You know, like if you're you're like a mercenary, you're a hired gun, you know, you sign these one, two year projects and just crank out code and 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 get paid and hey i mean it's 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 good living if you if you can get it and it was back then but did it look did it deliver successful projects i mean unfortunately more often than not it did not and so what, what we've learned since then is that you have to have that that customer focused mentality so thomas it's a little bit of a long-winded answer to your question but uh but but in general i think I, I wouldn't so much quibble over whether it's AI or not exactly, but what I would do is to try to figure out how my skill sets connect to uh, external customers and such. So <clears throat> anyhow, uh, I'm trying to see if I have anything more that I want to share with you guys on that today. I've written extensively about uh, career development over the years. Uh, one piece I wrote um last year at this time was has has ai really caused a massive retraining need then we need a retraining roadmap and uh so you can look that up on diginomica if you type in john reed and retraining you can probably find it um, but uh but i would tell you um that that these robots and job studies um you know they all come down to you know re- Repetitive work is threatened. I mean, that's obvious. Um, AI and jobs optimists believe the amount of new jobs, including higher value customer facing roles, will blunt the impact of jobs lost. I don't happen to agree with that. I think I think there are going to be uh, lost jobs in all of this in in terms of total amount of jobs, but that's not really the point. Um, there's there's middle ground, and that's where people have to find and most of the skills in demand are the skills that we actually used to look down upon and, and label as soft skills, but machines struggle with so-called soft skills. And so it's sort of the revenge of the soft skills Uh, in the, in the piece I wrote about um, the it's, it's far beyond the ability to communicate effectively around the water cooler. I said, it's about being a process expert. It's about a creative marketing ideas and exceptional content. It's about making sense of data and choosing the proper actions. It's about the savvy to solve complex problems and and to get teams to gel, which is obviously emotional intelligence as well. And it's also about ethics and policy making skills, um, including expertise in assessing human machine bias. And then there's the teeth of industry expertise, right? That it used to be that you could really hop from industry to industry. And that's really not the case. Uh, as much as it as it has been um, in the past, with sort sort of hot tech guys who and gals who could just jump from industry to industry, doesn't work as well now. 
you can still do it, but there's so much more value if you've seen a bunch of projects in one particular industry and can speak to what the, what the top performers in that industry do. Um, <clears throat> Okay, a couple more good questions. Sean, off the AI topic, have you talked much about mixed reality? You know, Sean, I've I've looked uh, at that topic and I've actually written some pieces on both virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, and if you look at Diginomica you'll, and do searches on those keywords, you'll see some stuff that I've written and other, other people as well. I think I was probably... I, I'll, I'll just be blunt. I think I was wrong about virtual reality. Well, I was wrong about augmented reality for sure, because I thought there was going to be more of an adoption of augmented reality to this point than there has been. Um, obviously, one of the key issues with all of this is is equipment. And so much of the early days of this stuff involved elaborate headgear <laughs> and was... Uh, you know, the virtual reality frontier is still primarily domain of, of gamers and um, I don't know, maybe porn addicts. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I couldn't tell you, but, you know, people who have intense needs to be in virtual worlds, uh, that doesn't seem to have really taken much hold in, in enterprise settings, um, although I've seen some amazing demos. Um, augmented reality is a little bit different, right? Because augmented reality is is what it sounds like and you're not virtually immersed in situations. And I've, I've thought that the pandemic might provoke this, especially man, manufacturing settings, right? Because think about like, you know, expensive equipment goes down and it's a lot harder to get someone to fly across the world to fix it. So could you have an augmented reality setup where um, someone, an expert is working from their, their home and guiding less skilled trainees uh, who are, you know, perhaps wearing some kind of like Google Glass type things or, you know, seeing some kind of a screen that you're on that kind of helped them guide them through it. I think we will see more traction with stuff like that. I mean, I've seen some really neat examples with real estate. You probably have to, uh, augmented reality is perfect for showing people the inside of, of homes if they're on the websites and stuff or mobile devices. So I think we'll we'll see more and more of that because it, it just kind of makes sense, especially the more it just becomes incorporated into just web and um, phone-based experiences. It I think when you talk about specialized equipment, uh, that's when it starts to lose a lot of appeal, though. In certain industrial settings, investing in equipment is not necessarily a bad thing. I, mean, I remember talking to a couple manufacturers about it who were like, yeah, people just don't want to wear this weird headgear, but I think people will get over looking weird. I mean, I don't think that's ultimately going to stop adoption for this stuff. <clears throat> Any insight on how Apple uses ML and even have chip that improves photos better at the moment? Where do you see that going? I'm impressed when going through my photos app, I can search dog and it's pretty accurate. Yeah. I mean, so a big part of this is like machines are better than humans at certain things for sure. And we're starting to get a clearer sense of that in, in image recognition and so-called computer vision is one area where machines clearly excel. I can't say for certain if I really consider a lot of that AI per se, but it's getting there a little bit, I suppose. I can speak to you more from a Google perspective because I'm a droid Google person. I haven't been an iPhone guy for, ever i've never been so um i can't really speak to that but on the google photos side which is what i use it is pretty impressive like you said where you can do searches for weird stuff um like uh my colleague dan hallett referenced my love of mushy peas for example which is like a d uk delicacy my partners live in the uk and so i did a search in my <laughs> google photos for cans because I, I didn't think it would be able to recognize peas, but I probably should check and see if it recognized peas. That'd be amazing. But it pulled the can right up, you know, and that's from like, what, 10,000 10, photos? Pulled a handful of cans up. I'm going to actually do a search for peas right now just to see if that actually, no results. Yeah, because the peas is really hard to read on the label and stuff. So that would be kind of amazing. Um, 
whether that's really AI, I don't really know. I mean, like, so for example, like if I go for a hike in the woods and take a bunch of pictures, I'll come back and, uh, and oftentimes like an hour later, Google photos has made a panoramic view of some of the photos. They've created some animation that they're showing me. Then there's some canvas that I can print out and buy if I want. So they're pitching me on all this stuff, but that's all machine generated. But I'm not sure if I'd call it AI just cause, um, I don't know if it's really like learning, like it's tricky there. I mean, that's semantics, I guess, but, um, but I will say that like, it is one of the better use cases I would have to agree is how some of these consumer things are handling photos. Google assistant on the other hand, on my phone, and I've heard Siri is worse. I'm, I'm not impressed with Google assistant on my phone at all. Even basic things like knowing which phone number, um, to, to, to call a friend at that I've called a number of times, and then stupid stuff like, oh, you know, you typically call your mom at this time of day, blah, blah, blah. When when I've only done that like once or twice and like I, I know when to call my mom. I don't need like help figuring that out like from, from AI. You know, I just think a lot of it is just more, to me, a lot of it resembles spray and pray email marketing more than anything very intelligent. Um, so I, I, I posted on Twitter a little while ago that I'm not too impressed by my Amazon devices and how... I don't think they're that really much more sophisticated than when I got them like three years ago, except they, they push more like bland shopping recommendations my way unsolicited, but that's about it. Um, not that I don't like them. I just don't think they've made a whole lot of progress, but, but having said that, I do think that, that we have to take the automation of work very, very seriously. And certainly from, from a, from a tech space standpoint, it, it is important. I mean, um, uh, like, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the the text tool that's come out. Uh, I'll look it up. Uh, but the, it fooled a bunch of Reddit users. Uh, and, uh, you know, it it is the kind of thing where I don't, uh, it's called GPT-3. Um, it actually got upvoted on Reddit. And, uh, you know, I, I think for, especially for like um, shorter things, like, I think you could legitimately in the very near future using that type of engine, you could pose as a person for a lot of online interactions and, and be fairly convincing for a while. I mean, you might eventually get called out or exposed, but I think it's a little scary how far it can go. Now they showed, um, I, I gave in hits and misses. I gave, uh, uh, I think it was MIT off to double check. I gave one, um, media outlet a hard time, for trying to scare me with like how brilliant an essay um, that this tool could write. It didn't do as well in, in article format and, and they basically compiled the best of a number of articles. Um, it was not nearly as convincing in that regard, but you know, obviously that stuff like that is already summarizing things like summarizing baseball games and anything that needs like kind of just a rote summary description uh, machines can, can, can be like very, very effective. And so you, you know, you do pay attention to that and realize like, you know, when you look ahead, you know, I've always like said there were two kinds of workers in this world. They're kind of like entrepreneurial workers that were kind of like self-starters. They might not own their own businesses. Like I'm more uh, own my own business person, but like entrepreneurial people can work in corporations as well. But then they're kind of the nine to five gang that clock in and out and they don't mind even like repetitive work and stuff like that. As long as they can just, they prioritize out of work, right? They prioritize their family life and their quality of life outside of the job. And I think those people are in a lot of trouble. Um, not, not just from AI and automation, but, but I think in general from that type of threat, because, you know, the tolerance level for kind of just turn your brain on if, off at work is very, very low when you, when you look ahead in the future. And so, like, I think that would be kind of my, my, my sort of thing for today is, is do that gap analysis and then do it every year and, and see how you progress. I mean, you could always come up for air quarterly and see how you're progressing on some of your goals, but, uh, that would be my, my recommendation. Uh, we have a comment from Sean here. XR is coming on slow, mainly because it's such a different user interaction. There are not many trained in 3d computer graphic in the ERP space. I'm trying to build a startup around a great use case in logistics. We'd love your feedback if you're interested in hearing more. Yeah, sure, Sean. Go ahead and send me a message on that. I'd like like to hear what you have to say there. 
I'm, I'm sure there are use cases and, you know, it, it's, it's really interesting how, you know, in the enterprise space, we have a whole different kind of way of looking at things because there's business models that don't have to succeed like in a mainstream way to be highly profitable and effective in certain industries. And a lot of even the consumer tech price doesn't understand that at all. So for example, like um, take Google Glass, for example, like, you know, it's like the rise and fall of Google Glass. Like one day Robert Scoball's like, uh, wearing Google glasses in the shower and Google glasses are cool. And then I show up at a conference and some idiots wearing a pair and he looks like a moron and, and I, and they're, they're not like helping him in any way. It's just a fashion statement. Then there's a fall from grace as people realize the glasses look stupid and they don't help me do anything and blah, blah, blah. So now Google glasses are passe or whatever, but in fact, um, you know, continue to persist in industrial settings where there actually were important use cases because you look at industrial settings when you when you can make um, an argument for um, you know hands free right so think of all the hands free occupations out there in the in the in the so called blue collar world that are really important and and then you start to think about yeah the value of of, of gear and willing to wear gear if you're halfway up a telephone pole are you going to wear some gear if it can free your hands up some more you bet you're going to wear some gear. So, um, but the consumer tech press moves on and thinks it's passe. I don't think it's passe, uh, but some of the use cases still have to be proven. Uh, we have another response here to you, Sean. They, um, this person would love to, um, to say more about, um, talk to you more. So, um, you guys can connect with each other. Hopefully <clears throat> if you need any help, just message me. So, uh, I'll keep going for a little while longer and answer a few more questions and comments for anyone who's hanging about. Uh, I'm going to go a little further in that article that I was going through with you. So here's, here's where I think we are falling short. We haven't figured out how to combine the skills we need for the future in one education. Um, even skills on the bullet points I outlined above, like coding and design, are hard to combine in one person. Our entire educational system is misaligned with what is coming. Um, so for example, I think a liberal arts education is actually a pretty darn good education still for the future of work. But the problem is liberal arts schools are closing right and left. I happen to know this because I was involved in trying to save one of them this summer. And, uh, and yet it's tragic because that type of education is actually very appropriate to the type of human we're going to need to thrive amidst the machines, but those liberal arts uh, curriculums have not been imbued with what I would call uh, data literacy to a certain extent, um, technical skills, uh, uh, the ethics of algorithmic life. Very little of that is part of those curriculums. So, you know, on the contrast, some of the more technical and business educations don't get into some of the more creative and ethical issues um, that liberal arts education get into. So, our educational system is just horribly misaligned with this with this workforce, and that puts the onus more and more on 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 us, and to some extent our employers to figure that out. We define the soft skills that are needed, but we haven't articulated how human talent will work with, amongst, and for machines. Um, this is my digital natives issue. I have such an issue with this idea that oh, this next generation digital natives, so they'll be fine. Yeah, just because they're glued to their smartphones doesn't mean they're going to thrive in an automated workplace. I don't, smartphone savvy doesn't equate to the machine savvy humans will need in specialized settings like shop floors or IoT powered retail. Yeah, you, you know you're going to have your phone as an interface when you're when you're working the floor, perhaps. But the fusion of these these advanced skills and soft skills has just not been done yet, and. Uh, and then we issue these excited calls for retraining, but we haven't defined how the retraining is going to work. So, and, and without getting political, because I know we do have something going on in this country right now around elections, I do want to point out that neither of the candidates had anything good or useful to say about this issue at all. Um, so there's very, very little awareness on the macro level of the changes that the workforce needs to undertake and I would extend that well beyond the two presidential candidates, though, to be fair, there were a couple of presidential candidates uh, 
Andrew Yang comes to mind for sure, who, who did have much more interesting things to say on that topic. <clears throat> All right, how we doing? Do you see the Google Assistant recognizing and understanding speech with different accents? By the way, way better than Siri as AI. Um, that's a really tough one. I mean, honestly, not to my more stringent definition, unless unless you would see it improving as you interact with it more and more, then I think it does feel more like AI. But the the reality is that some some um, systems recognize accents better than others out of the box. I don't know that that's AI, but if you see it continuing to improve its interaction with you, that that to me is AI. Like one thing that blows my mind is my Amazon devices. They don't, honestly, they don't understand me any better than the first day I got them in here. And I, I just think that's, that's fundamentally disappointing. Um, but I will say like, you know, I, I do get my mind blown sometimes by advances. I've been meaning to write about um, as an example of this otter.ai, which some of you might've used for um, machine transcripts, but oh my gosh, those, those transcripts are getting better and better. There does have to be a certain baseline of recording quality. Um, but, you know, so for example, if, if you're recording in a crowded room, it's going to struggle. But like for, for, even for things like sketchy Zoom calls and stuff, I've been very, very impressed. And, and the interesting thing about Otter, and they're not, I'm not, I'm a paid customer of theirs, but I mean, there's other services that provide some of these things and some of them are also pretty good, but they built a whole like universe of things around it. And so that's when you think about how your career progresses, how you think about technology, you're evolving into this platform mentality, right? Where like, so I have it integrated with my Dropbox, for example, and it's integrated with zoom and, and I can share it with team members. And so it's not just an isolated thing, but but it's radically changed my whole thing because now all my interviews go there. It's super affordable to get them transcribed. And now I have a repository of searchable transcripts, which I never had before. So, you know, you, you see these things evolving in promising ways, but I don't necessarily get impressed until I see things getting better and better and learning um, each time. via Andrew Yang, he made sense. What happened to him? He would have been way better. Maybe he can come back. Um, well, I'm not going to really get into a political show tonight. I'm sorry, man. That's just not going to happen. But uh, but I, I think the way I would look at it is that, let me try to be very diplomatic here. I think some candidates accomplished what they, what they set out to, and I think he did. He brought certain issues to the fore that were very important for the country to be thinking about. And I'm sure he'll find other ways of doing it in the future. So I, I hope he keeps up. I haven't been keeping tabs on him since he dropped out. So I'd ask, what are they doing with all the data and machine learning? Right. And so there's all kinds of issues, right? Like, so I'm highly cognizant of the fact that I've, when I invite Amazon into my house, I'm making a choice between privacy and convenience and I'm, absolutely erring on the side of convenience over privacy. Um, that should be my person in my worldview. That should be my personal choice to make. The, the problem of course, is that these companies keep moving the goalposts and you don't always know what you're opting into or opting out of. And that's not really fair. Um, and unfortunately we need more regulations, but it gets back to what I was saying earlier. I don't think the people that are making the regulations necessarily understand the technology. So that's, that's a little bit disconcerting. Um, but I will tell you, I had an argument with a guy, uh, doing a chatbot startup <laughs> and, uh, it was a super interesting conversation because I was basically telling him that chatbots are not very sophisticated. And, uh, he said, well, actually, um, my chatbot is as good as your data, which gets back to LinkedIn users point. <laughs> um, you know, and, and so in other words, like if, if your documentation is good enough, like your chatbot can potentially be pretty kick-ass. Now I happen to think there's more to it than that because like I said, I think proper escalation into human um, intervention is one of the key components of chatbots that I see missing. Um, 
but a lot of it is designed to, right? Like, so you go on a lot of websites now. If you go on a technology vendor's website, you're going to get assaulted by a chatbot in like three seconds. And the, some of them are so irritating because they don't even, they force you to choose between responses. You can't even enter like an open text response. Um, and um, anyway, I had an argument with the PR person about this because they sent me uh, an email about hyper-personalization and I had two issues with it. And one was that I, I don't think the tech is quite there yet. They were using the example of a hotel that knows exactly what you want, sends you the perfect offer. But what I said to them is I said, the problem is that spray and pray is so affordable and people don't care about the downside. So yeah, they could send a hyper-personalized offer to a very small percentage of people or they could spray and pray. And what's the worst can happen? Well, some handful of people unsubscribe and I don't think they care. So they keep sending me offers, these hotels to want me to come take vacations, even though I've never taken a personal vacation in my life. Well, that's an exaggeration, but <laughs> nine out of 10 times, if I met you at a hotel, I met there for work and, uh, but they don't care. And, and it's, I don't think it's even that their data sets are bad. I think they're, they don't mind just taking the risk because they figure 10% or 20% of the people like me are going to basically respond to their offer. And they don't really care about the fact that a handful of grouches like me are going to unsubscribe because most people won't even bother to unsubscribe. They don't even see it or they just move on to something else. But uh, anyhow, um, I heard back from that PR person. They said, well, we spent a bunch of time talking about your comment and we totally agree with you. So anyway, I'm going to potentially have an interview with them next week and try to hash that out a little bit. So <clears throat> let me just finish this, uh, going through this article. I had a couple more things to say about this. Talked about the trade-offs between on-the-job learning, short-term immersion, and long-term immersion. Uh, I did a, a piece on that with VJ, VJ Sankar of IBM on overcoming AI, ML, and data science skills. If you do a search for VJ and John Reed on Diginomica, you'll find it. So I talk about how we need a skills acquisition plan. And I finally wrapped up by just saying um, retraining is personal. Um, and you have to strike a balance um, between knowing your industry, uh, knowing and, and being empowered by your company to pursue your skills development. So a big part of it is having the right employer and projects. I mean, one of the classic trade-offs in the IT industry is you can get paid a lot of money to work on projects where your skills are stagnating. And that can be a very dangerous uh, position. I mean, look, I mean, there's still some COBOL programmers out there getting paid, right? I mean, because at some point, there's such a dwindling number that you can actually still make money. Some of those folks are doing fine. There's still some J.D. Edwards folks out there doing fine because there's not many of them left. Um, but it can really back you into a corner. And so, you know, one of the biggest things is, is finding a way to avoid chasing rates and instead... Um, chasing the projects that really push your skills development and aligning with employers that in, invest in your skills. And so that's a really big consideration because you can't learn it all on your own. You can certainly pursue a lot of side projects of value, and those are always worth doing. But at some point, you have to get it from your employer and project. And really, that's really how you start to excel. If you can't do it in real life on a project, it doesn't have the same bona fides. So um, finally, I'm going to put in a plug for what I call deep work. Um, and <clears throat> I've written a lot about this on Diginomica as well. Well, like once every six months, I indulge in it. Uh, just type in John Reed, productivity and deep work and Diginomica in Google. You'll find it. But uh, but I'm a big, huge proponent of deep work because I think most of us are way too distracted by social noise. And so in other words, figuring out how to create filters that protect your time is really, really valuable. And, and deep work is how you develop uh, new skills and intellectual property that can help differentiate you in your career. And that's a really, really huge piece of the puzzle. Um, I actually kind of, I have a deep work creative cycle that I've developed that, that combines uh, what you might call reflection uh, and then deep research which I combine with curation where I share some of the fruits of that research 
like I do that on my John Pierre news feed on Twitter is one example of that. Um, so it's like reflection, research, and then creative output. Those are all, it's all part of this sort of deep work cycle. And for me, that there's a real competitive advantage that can be seized by that. Not to mention it's great for your sanity to figure out how to turn off some of those devices and protect your time a little better. Um, one more thing. <laughs> so in closing, what you're hoping for is in 10 to 15 years, AI on Amazon and all those retailers will finally be decent. Uh, I think it could be sooner than 10 to 15 for that. Um, you know, I, I think that's, that's something where it just really comes down a little bit to their, their, they're honing their business model, right? So right now, for example, Amazon's AI can't really differentiate between like a high value prime customer versus like a newbie and, and treat the two accordingly. Um, but in the future, it won't be that hard for AI to differentiate between different types of customers, give them different levels of service and, and human escalation based on their importance as customers, different things like that. I think that might be more three to five years out, but where I am more concerned and where I think might be more 10 years out is getting a smart device in your home that can actually be, feel more like a companion that understands you a little bit, even a little bit, um, and learns from your preferences in a helpful way. But again, it comes down to goals, right? Because even if my Amazon devices and I'm sure you've noticed I figured out how to avoid saying their name. So won't talk to me right now. <laughs> but even if my Amazon devices understand me a lot better, Amazon's going to have a hard time resisting pushing out offers to these devices. Even if they know there's only a small percentage, I'm going to take it because what am I going to do? Rip out my devices? And that's the problem with lock-in. And 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 obviously in the enterprise, lock-in's a huge, huge issue. Um in the consumer sector, it is an issue as well, though, because I can't, yeah, I have consumer choice, but I'm not going to rip out all my Amazon gear and put in like Apple or Google Home, like not not without a lot of consideration. Um, so those are the issues that are going to foil that, that sort of perfect personalization because vendors are going to be very, very tempted to, to run stuff up the flagpole because the numbers are on their side if they do that. And the fact that I'm all irritated by it, well, so what? Am I going to rip out their devices? That's the problem. Uh, so anyway, the, these are the dilemmas that all of us have to have to work through and find the right balance. Uh, deep work and attention deficit. Your thoughts? I mean, look, I'm I'm not a doctor, so I can't help people with clinical conditions. Um, but I I will say this: like, I think there's a lot of things that are good for people with attention deficit, things like meditation, long outdoor walks. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I, I would say deep massage, but unfortunately we're not in a deep massage era for safety reasons. <laughs> uh, but these types of things can calm the mind and you have to find what calms your mind a little bit. I think that's a little bit different than deep work, um, but there is a sense in which we all have to take some ownership over the noise in our lives. And um, I can't resolve people's medical and psychological problems any more than I can resolve some of my own. <laughs> but I do think that we can be a lot better at protecting our time and, uh, you know, and, and redoing things. I mean, just as one example, um, I only check email once a day now. Um, and um, to do that, I've had to do a bunch of different things, including, making it possible for my clients to find me on other channels when they need me. Um, my partners are aware of it as well. Um, look, do I occasionally pay the price for checking email once a day? I do. Um, but, um, and are there people who assume I'm checking my email and then we have a problem? Uh, it happens sometimes, but oh my gosh, for my sanity, like that's been huge. And I'm not saying that's what you should do, but there's different things like that that will work for you. And, you know, I, I, I often tell people like airplane mode on your phone, try it at home. Sometimes it's a beautiful thing. And when you, when you learn, and I don't, I don't mean airplane mode with Wi-Fi. I mean like total airplane mode. <laughs> and when, when you learn how to do those things, you look out for yourself and 
you know, uh, we have to really be mindful of that because it's so easy for us to take our work wherever we are right now, because work is us right now. Right. I mean, anyone who has a job in this economy is, is, is striving like hell to hold on to it. <clears throat> LinkedIn user. It can still cycle with people starting working in this Amazon and learning basics and spreading out. We need a con consultancy mode that has independence from historical Arthur Anderson legacy. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm really down on the gig economy, which is that sense of uh, larger corporations exploiting uh, an on-demand workforce without rights. And obviously there's a big thing going on in California right now. And, uh, with with the vote there on on Uber and Lyft uh, and employee benefits, but um, I'm really down on gig economy stuff because I feel like it's really just another form of exploitation. But um, you know, I, I've written extensively about the value of independent experts on enterprise projects, and that's absolutely the case. Uh, which is not to say that consulting firms never have value, but I think being an independent expert and advisor can be very, very valuable to, to customers. Um, I will say, I think it's gotten a lot harder to be a pure independent anymore. Um, but there are still ways of getting aligned with uh, a boutique, for example, of, of independence and joining forces, which is kind of what Diginomica is by the way. Um, and it's worked out really well for us. And I don't think we could have done accomplish what we did on our own, um, by any means. Um, but the same is true in the consulting side as well. And, and absolutely. And, and we need a model for that, but we need also an urgency on companies parts to realize that, that independents provide a unique value to them. Um, wh when I bring this up, I get some pushback around politics because the one advantage to having one prime, like pick the prime IBM, Accenture, Deloitte, whoever it is, is that you have less politics because your prime is running the show and everyone understands that when you have some independent coming in, some wiseacre doing audits of the, of the project, uh, the prime's not too happy about that. Um, but it all comes down to the customer taking more ownership of the project. And I know some people who do an awesome job in, in various software arenas of being various kinds of experts on projects and, uh, and making a difference for customers. And they do it in very different ways. And I've, I've written about a number of them over the years. Um, some of them are retired now or working for larger companies, but I had Brian summer on last week and he'll, he told me he wants to come back on. So I guess he enjoyed his first experience with our radio format. So he will be, I think a regular guest. Uh, and, uh, Brian's more of an independent, uh, advisor. Um, and then you have, you know, someone like my buddy, Jarrett Pazahonic, who is an SAP HCM consultant who has really built himself up um, an industry around what he does by himself and, uh, has become, you know, a, a customer advocate in his own right, along with an expert in SAP HCM solutions that it places him in high value customers. And, uh, those people have very interesting business models because they've created a lot of IP around what they do. Um, in, in, in Jared's case, he's got these massive LinkedIn groups dedicated to success factors that he built. Um, so, you know, everyone's got their own way of doing it, but the point is, you can succeed as independent, but you kind of have to build a little empire around yourself as well. And, uh, and that's where the deep work and creation of IP comes in. Steve Jobs said, old people want to know how something happens and young want to know what a thing can do. Does the ERP world need a jobs moment? Um, I think in a way the ERP world is getting that just not in the way that we thought. Um, it's not like a whole new ERP systems coming in to rip out the old ones. Though I would tell you in the small and mid market, there's a number of very interesting cloud ERP players that are doing things pretty differently. Um, but in the large enterprise hasn't worked that way, but there's a whole bunch of cloud vendors that are coming in and, chunking out different pieces of what we once thought of as ERP. And if ERP doesn't get his act together, I think it's going to wither into a, a pathetic little core and then um, a back office functionality. 
and 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 some of the vendors that are taking chunks out of ERP are really interesting. And and I, I might put some of the analytics vendors in that category also. We had that conversation last week. We could talk about that. But uh, but but in general, do we need like visionaries? Yeah. It's kind of weird. It's like we need more visionaries and more customer accountability at the same time. And and getting those two things right can be tough because sometimes visionaries don't give a crap what customers want as per the famous Steve Jobs quote about that. Uh, so you have to find find that middle ground. I think there's probably a little bit of both there. I wish we could create more work groups to work together across all these models and industries. Yeah, and I, I probably should have that was probably one of the things I didn't mention in my skills roundup today is that cross-functional cross-technical thing of being able to work across lines of business and um, diverse teams of diverse stakeholders. This is, this is the future of, of successful projects. Um, it does make projects harder in some cases, but what, what it's all about is, is, is not being bunkered down for a long period of time, but having a constant feedback loop, uh, to make things better and, 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 and then adjusting software and adjusting configuration, uh, on the fly. Uh, oh, here we have, we have a good independent in the chat. Neil Raiden, one of my favorite independents, he's been one for 35 years. I took over a data warehouse project. CFO said, who is that itinerant hippie from California? Absolutely. And, um, Neil, if you want an example of a, of a great independent that's making a difference out there and also knows a shitload about AI and ethics, check Neil's stuff on Diginomica, look him up on LinkedIn. He's exactly the kind of person that customers need out there. And Neil, I would simply say, um, you know, I wish I, I knew more younger folks in our industry that aspired to the kind of career that you've had. And I, I wish there were more of them because a lot of the independents that I admire more have had a lot of real world experience. And I'd love to see younger people saying, how could I achieve that someday? I realize maybe it's not, they don't perceive it as glamorous, but to me, like being a kind of like that swashbuckling expert who comes in and um, really speaks truth to power and shares ex vital expertise, so important. Think of all these projects um, in the AI domain, Neil, that you've probably seen that that have gotten off based on false assumptions and you know, would that they had you in early on to to have a talk about the ethics of what they're doing and and whether they're going to get a proper uh, fair result that makes their business better and improves their business reputation or whether they're going to fall on their asses. Um, this is why people like you are needed out there. Um, so I, absolutely, I just wish there were there were more. But come to think of it, we should do a piece on on your independent model sometimes because you've been able to do it for a long time. So. Um, but again, another example of someone who's created a whole lot of intellectual property around what he does, which is one fundamental key, I think, to succeeding as an independent. Otherwise, you you won't succeed. Too competitive out there. Vendors throwing too much money around. Neil, I'm sure you've had to turn down some silly offers from silly vendors. But the thing I like about a guy like him is that he's probably never going to take one of those, those off. I mean, I'd be shocked if he did. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, yeah, it, obviously, yeah, it, it absolutely can be lonely. And I mean, and, but I think, I think that's in, in many ways, that's what kind of forming networks of like-minded folks is all about. Even if you're not in, in business with them, it, you know, I, I kind of glom onto sort of eccentric and maverick consultants at shows um, because I need to have that sense of community and also just understand their perspectives so I can press vendors better and get to the bottom of things. And um, there's a camaraderie that forms around that, um, that that's priceless. And But you do have to cultivate those relationships and uh, it, it can feel lonely because a lot of, it, it's not the same kind of funny money we had in our industry in the 90s, but there's still a lot of people making a whole lot of money pushing a whole lot of overhyped crap out there that, that doesn't help customers. And so those of us who don't like that, it is, it does get lonely sometimes. I mean, look, I'm doing a video show by myself. So, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, like at some point you, you can't like be afraid of it anymore. You just have to kind of do it. And uh, you know, I've been going on for like about an hour here with this on my own. So, you know, I guess you can do it um, in the future. Uh, it's going to be very rare for me to do, 
do a show by myself, but I can't promise that I'll never do it because I've kind of had a good time today. Um, I'm going to take a couple more comments and then my voice is about to give. So I think I'm just about done. Neil, do you have any um, comments you'd like to share on um, the impact of AI on enterprise careers? We can wait for a sec while Neil types. LinkedIn user, I'm about to sign off. So if you have any more comments, but uh, I do encourage uh, encourage folks to ping me after the show and I'll try to take your feedback into account for future guests that can expand upon these topics. Let me go through my Diginomic articles and see if I want to stress anything else. Uh, I recommend a piece I wrote called Breaching the IT Soft Skills Quagmire. It's an old piece at this point. Um, but I think, again, like, like this whole soft skills thing, like it's not just about Toastmasters, right, and being a good speaker and communi communicator. Um, I In that piece, I link to a ton of um, deep soft skills um, that people can be developing that will help round out their technical. And then um, I wrote an interesting piece in 2016, the enterprise skills debate, specialist or generalist. So that's a really interesting one. How much specialization should you have and how much generalization? Because one thing you don't want is to wind up with the wrong specialization. For example, blockchain. Oh, sorry. Um, I don't mean to diss the blockchain uh, enthusiasts out there. Um, <clears throat> But, but you have to, you have to be a little careful sometimes about what you choose to, to focus on. So that, that piece on specialization versus generalization, you may want to look that up also if you have time. Uh, Thomas, welcome back. You were distracted. What's been the question, man? We, we've been all over the place a little bit, but um, actually Thomas, we're talking about the importance of uh, independent experts and advisors on enterprise projects and what it takes to become such an expert. I'm sure you would have something to say about that. Uh, I'm going to wrap up in a few minutes, Thomas, but if you have a chance to type in a quick comment on that, I'd love to take it before, before I close out for the day. We're helping your daughter with your homework. Well, I, I'm not going to fault you there, man. Um, that daughter's daughter's over enterprise video any day. Neil says, changing fast. What was mysterious a year ago is common now, but the basics are still needed. Agreed. And um, Neil, one of the things I'm, I'd be interested in, maybe we'll have a video conversation about this some point. You can come on the show. But uh, the importance of, of that deep statistical and mathematical analysis. Uh, I, would, I would assume that in many cases that's incredibly valuable. Um, to, to dig into that, um, to inform your technical skills. By the way, if you want to read about the black box in AI and the infamous problems with explainability, do a little Neil Radin search on Diginomica for that. Give Thomas another minute to type in anything he wants to type in. Thomas, you're on the clock, man. I'm going to wrap up in a sec. Once again, Thomas, your advice is independent advisors, keys to success. Okay. And you've come through with a comment. Excellent. Well, to be able to advise, help businesses with their projects, one needs to have done some oneself and seen the good, bad, and ugly. In my opinion, it pays off to stay close to projects rather than just to advisor. Right. Rolling up your sleeves, no replacement for project credibility and experience. That's for sure. Good job, Thomas. Thanks. Neil says, I don't think organizations have yet to converge on where they're going with AI. Definitely. 
there was a really interesting um, report, a couple of them that I summed up in hits and misses, I think last week around um, overall lack of success on AI projects to this point. Um, but that doesn't mean that companies aren't going to invest in it. It just means they're having trouble figuring out how to be successful, which is no real surprise. On the other hand, I think like if you want to go down a, a couple layers to workflow automation, that's obviously um, no question that's that's been important. And companies who have been able to figure out how to do some of that this year have had less business disruption. So, but again, I don't consider that AI. So it's different. Oh, absolutely, Thomas. Um, this, uh, Thomas, this is a little bit of a different uh, type of mentality I bring to these shows. I, I'm, I'm treating it like it's called Enterprise Hits and Misses Radio. It's basically shooting the shit like radio talk show format, except instead of callers, we have texters. But uh, so um, you never know what you get called upon. Um, although I can, I can pull people in on cam, which I may do in the future if I do a solo show again. But I've been doing this for an hour now. And I think I've I've reached uh, diminishing returns on my willingness to sit here. So um, I want to thank everyone who joined me. I hope you actually got something out of it. Um, again, we were talking about AI skills and career development, and we got into a whole bunch of different pieces of success in the enterprise. I wish you all the sanity in the world as you um, get through this period of, of hopefully uh, – political transition in this country in a peaceful way and uh, try to stay sane. <laughs> Don't watch too much uh, uh, network television and uh, I'll catch you on the other side. And, oh, and by the way, this is generally going to be Friday at 4 PM and e Eastern time. And I'm usually going to have a guest, uh, but there will always be um, interactive comments like, like we're doing today. All right. See you next time.